This is the Self-Employed Mum Podcast, the raw, honest truths of what it takes to be a mum and an entrepreneur. Running a business while raising small humans is an entirely different ballgame. And if you, like me, are in the thick of it right now, this podcast is for you. I'm your host, Rhiannon Loudon, mum of two, proud entrepreneur, and CEO of two small businesses. And my guests, women who are juggling all the plates, building businesses while raising the next generation. Thanks for tuning in, and don't forget to like, follow, and spread the word to help keep this podcast going. Now on to today's episode. Welcome to another episode of the Self-Employed Mum podcast. I am Rhiannon Loudon, your host, and I am joined today by the fabulous Sarah Stewart, who is a time management coach and is here to talk us through all of the ways that we can better manage our time when we are juggling motherhood and entrepreneurship. Hey, Sarah. Hi, I am super excited to be here. Thanks for having me. Thanks so much for coming on the podcast. And so I'm going to let Sarah explain in a little bit more detail what a time management coach is and what exactly she does. Um, But before I do that, I just wanted to say I have just started working with Sarah because um, as many of you will know who have listened to this podcast for some time or if you follow me on Instagram, I find managing my time to be one of the most difficult parts about entrepreneurship, especially with small children at home. Um, and I think it's something that I really needed some outside help with. So I'm really excited that Sarah's agreed to come on and share her sort of perspective and expertise. Um, and yeah, take it away, Sarah. Tell us a little bit about you and what you do. Yeah. So I guess like firstly, you know, when I share with people that my niche is time management, most people respond with, I could really use your help. <laughs> so that's that's really common <laughs> um especially as you know um women in business with a family too like even more so because there's just there is a lot that you know we're we're juggling um but in terms of what i do um my background is actually pharmacy so i'm a scientist by training um i even went on and did a phd in pharmaceutical science and i worked for 14 years in the pharmaceutical industry and my niche was project and program management which sort of gives you uh, an idea of my background because I then took that and leveraged it for my coaching practice. So I've been self-employed now for two and a half years and I trained as a transformational life coach but ended up niching into time and it just sort of landed well with me it felt right because of my corporate background I've always sort of been known for my organization planning skills and so on um and uh, yeah I'm sort of delighted to share that with other people no that's great and I mean I don't know that much about the coaching world because it's it's quite different to what I do but tell us is um is time management a sort of you know you said you sort of found your niche but is that an area that a lot of people focus on because from what I've seen you know you see a lot of business coaches or you see life coaches um but you've obviously gone quite specific and I know that you kind of factor in some of those other things into what you do but how did you how did you find such a sort of specific niche how did you how did that all come about? Great question. And I I actually wish that I could remember what prompted it. But I had sort of started off thinking that I might, um, you know, work with women, something around confidence or something in that sort of area. Um, and it wasn't until I was having a conversation with someone and I can't remember who it was, sadly, and they sort of asked me, you know, why why are you not bringing in all that great lived experience and, you know, knowledge from your project management days into the coaching space? And it was just that like light bulb moment. And when I reflect back on my story, time has always been a theme throughout everything that I've done. And I actually had my first life coach when I was 20. And I sadly lost my mom to cancer when I was 19. And 
at that point in time, I was at university studying pharmacy, which is a really difficult degree. So I was like studying at night. I had a part-time job. I was a lifeguard. And then now all of a sudden I had a house to manage. And so there were meals to cook, the supermarket shop, um, house to clean. And it was a lot, it was an awful lot for me to take on as a as a 19 year old. Um, I do have a sister, she's slightly younger than me. So it sort it sort of fell to me to to take on the running of the house. And um yeah, it was an awful lot. And my dad um hired me a coach and we started working on how to prioritize, how to schedule. And it's like these fundamental skills do not get taught at school. Like, you know, I was never taught how to set up a calendar and best use my time. And so we started working on all of those different kinds of things. And whether it's been that, the fact that I learned those skills so early on in my sort of working life, you know, it really stood me in great stead then going into the corporate space. Um, so yeah, this sort of theme of time and how to use time has all always been there. Um, so yeah, I and, and I'm just so passionate. Like I think it's such a fundamental skill that if you can get that right, it just has this massive positive ripple effect across so many areas of your life. You know, if you're trying to make a change and improve your health and fitness or you need time to do that if you're trying to build a business and you're maybe still in a day job you need time to create and work on on your your side business and so a lot of stuff comes back to time and so when I then landed in that niche of time management it really did just like everything just started to click and it felt really right and it felt like me but you're right there aren't many there are other there are other time management coaches but there aren't many well and it's such you know you're right when you think about it like time is the one thing that is the most precious really to all of us you know at the risk of sounding really like now nah, it's very precious but it is it's the <laughs> one thing that you only have so yeah. much of and you know I often say like to my um to my VA Emily I'll you know we send voice notes back and forth and I'll send her a message and say oh I just wish I could clone myself and it's that way of like we're all so busy and whatever extra responsibilities you have, like some people are, aren't parents, but they're carers or so many of us are mm -hmm. juggling, you know, motherhood at the same time as running businesses. And it's like, you only have so many hours in a day. How do you figure out, as you say, priorities and how do you make time for all of the things that are important to you? And I mean, that absolutely should be something that we're taught in school. But I think these kind of major life skills, unless you have a parent who's really passionate about it, or, you know, you had that experience of dealing with such a huge loss at such a young age, and then the coaching that kind of corresponded from that. Um, so you probably had quite a good grasp on that from the time that you were a very young adult, whereas most of us, you know, I'm in my late thirties now, and I don't have any kind of grasp on how to manage my time. So <laughs> it's, I'm glad that you found that niche. Um, and it's really interesting that it came to you so organically as well. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So tell us a little bit, I always ask everyone to kind of tell us the ages of their children so we could get an idea of what stage oh. that they're at. So tell us a little bit about your sort of home life, if you will. Yeah, of course. So I'm a single parent. Um, so I have been separated now for nearly 12 years um, and my kids are 14 and 12. Wow. So you've got a lot on your plate because you don't, you know, especially doing it yourself when you've got a business that you're growing and the two kids and, you know, as much as yes, when kids are young, they're really full on. Obviously, when you hit the teenage years, there's different challenges there. So you've definitely got a lot going on over yeah. there. Yeah. And I think when they were younger, I mean, my daughter was nine months old when I landed as a single parent. And um, yeah, it was hard. The I was going back into work after my maternity leave. So, but it was me on my own having to do night feeds, get two kids under three ready for nursery in the morning, get myself to work. And yeah, it was it was quite the time. And, I, you know, I think a, lo a lot of that 
period was spent on autopilot and just this is what I had to do um and and sort of to get through but you're right they're the the, the kids it's very physically demanding when they are younger and then then there's sort of a a period where it does get easier and it's nice but and then you hit the hormones <laughs> and the, the, the sort of the teenage um years which is sort of what I'm kind of coming through now and it becomes very emotionally demanding so they're less physically demanding you know and I can leave them and let them do their own thing and they're you know they're quite keen to do their own thing a lot of the time so I do have a lot more time now in that respect but it's then the space that it takes up in my head like worrying about all the different things that are going on so let's chat through then a little bit about the sort of challenges so obviously everybody has an infinite amount you know we don't have an infinite amount of time everybody has things that they have to get done in a day but maybe we could chat through sort of some of the additional challenges of running your business when you have all of these sort of added obstacles of raising children um and you know as you know yourself and as I know very well that even the best laid plans can very easily get disrupted when something happens um in your sort of you know when you've got your mum hat on so yeah let's let's chat through some of that how do you so say that I have my week totally planned out and I know which hours are for work and which hours are for the kids and I think great everything's organized and then uh one of them wakes up with norovirus and that throws my whole week off so I guess what kind of advice or how would you suggest that people deal with these sort of things that crop up in our schedule yeah I think the first part is the com- like compassion to oneself I think that's a big part of it mm-hmm. because it's just knowing that these things do happen you know we're we're not going to be able to control everything down to the last minute um and so I think there is something around like looking at it through a lens of compassion because a lot of my clients will create the plan and especially when we're at the start of our journey when it's novel and exciting and they're more motivated they'll jump in and create the plan and it probably will go to plan to start with but then maybe by like week two or three it's maybe not going to plan so much but I think it's just that knowing that the plan should not be set in stone that I think that's the first the first sort of part of it just an acknowledgement that it's it shouldn't be set in stone Mm -hmm. because things will come up and that thing that comes up it might not have to be a bad thing like it might be that there's an opportunity that comes your way that you want to jump on at short notice rather than it being you know something like a child getting ill or whatever so there's like the two sides to it but it's knowing that it's okay to adjust and I think for me you know I I think it's important to be zooming out and looking at the big picture as well as zooming in and looking at the week. Mm -hmm. So even if a week doesn't go to plan, it's knowing that across the quarter or that half of the year that you know the direction that you're headed in, you've got the, you know, the activities in your schedule and so on that are going to take you closer to that goal and if you do have a week that, that doesn't go quite to plan, that's okay. You know, that I love that idea too about sort of having a little bit of compassion for yourself because it's easy. I tend to like, what's the right word? Like disasterize things. So say that I had a full day of meetings and one of the girls wakes up and they're sick and I'm thinking like, oh, what am I going to do? I'm letting all of these people down. It looks unprofessional. I have to cancel on them. But the thing is, we are all human and most of the vast majority of my clients are also working mums, mums running a business. And so, I mean, anytime I have had to reschedule meetings or explain, oh, there's going to be, you know, a sick one in the background watching, yeah. you know, the iPad or whatever, where we're having the call, everyone's been really good about it because they've been there. And I think for me, part of that was finding the right kind of clients. And because I speak on, you know, on my social media, on my website, I speak about being a mom and the added challenges and things like that. I think 
the people that are drawn for me are people that are in a similar place in their life and do have that understanding and are willing to be flexible. And I mean, most people are reasonable. Like you might get the occasional person who isn't, but realistically, most of us know that life happens and things crop up yeah. and um, it's just hard not to get stuck in that. Like, oh, things didn't go to plan and now my whole week's ruined. And I really like your point too on looking at the bigger picture. Well, maybe I didn't get all of these things done this week. But if I look at the month or the quarter, that's not really that much of a setback. I can make up for that in the weeks to come. So I like that idea. That's putting a good positive spin on it as well. Yeah. Yeah. And I think, I mean, COVID in a sense has helped that, you know, it's shown a little bit more behind the scenes. And, you know, we, yeah. we did have to ad adapt and work from home. And there were kids going around, you know, I am... Um, even before COVID, I worked from home and I was in a global role with a pharmaceutical company and did a lot of work with America. And so my hours of work were quite different in the sense that, you know, I would be meeting in the morning with my European teams and then having calls in the evening with the Americans. And even pre-COVID, if it's the right company, they get it. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I can remember being on calls with, with um, you know, other project teams and clients that I was working on and you know they hear my kids in the background and but it was okay and it's and I think it is you know a lot a lot of this comes down to how we communicate like you said you know you're you share that that this is your experience and I do too and so I think it's then we we do attract the right kind of people yeah, I do. I think that's such a big part of it. I think what you said about COVID is really relevant too. Like I've had this conversation with a few people lately about, I'm always kind of a little bit unsure about saying the good things that came out of COVID, because obviously there were loads of yeah. horrible things that happened. Um, but I do think it's made us all a little bit more understanding as human beings. And as you say, you know, people were working from home and juggling kids. And I don't know, I think we're kind of more used to it now. And maybe you know our sort of perspective has shifted and that that doesn't make us unprofessional that just shows that we're juggling lots of things um which I think is only a good thing this idea of trying to separate completely your work and your home life I I don't think it's possible it's not for me anyway because the two are just so closely knit together and they do overlap even when you plan you know as you yeah. say like things don't go to plan um and I wanted to ask your perspective on this too so you were talking about, you know, um, understanding that maybe plans can't be set in stone because you are going to have to be flexible even more so when you have, you know, children at home. Um, so do you think, is there merit in maybe us, what's the right way to put it, filling our schedules a little less? Because where I find it the most difficult when things don't go to plan is when I have like scheduled every day to the max and there's no room for flexibility. So is there sort of merit in trying to have flex time in your schedule so that if these things crop up, you can still kind of rejig things in any given week or month or whatever? Yeah, so I very much don't pack my schedule back to back. Um, I think the white space and that buffer is needed, especially when you are starting out on a journey looking at your time management I think you're probably more likely going to need the buffer more then because most people they will overestimate what they can do in a day and they underestimate how long things are going to take mm -hmm. and so it does take some practice to learn how long it takes you to do things so that then you can then create a thoughtful and robust schedule that is going to work and the more you do it and the more you practice, the easier it becomes. But I would say at the start, yes, you definitely want more white space. And I think, you know, there's also something around like working with your energy as well and being mindful of that. Mm -hmm. So I have got Crohn's disease and that also impacts my time, that impacts my energy. And that then needs to be reflected in my schedule. So there are instances where I know, you know, and, and sometimes it is out of our hands and I might, I might have a busy day of meetings, but then I know that maybe the next again day where things maybe more, you know, are more in my control that I can 
take that back and make sure that I've got more white space and you know blocking out like next week I know I've got a couple of half days blocked out just purely to rest and that's okay yeah and I I like what you're saying there because I think for so many people they almost feel guilty when when they it's like all that time should be if it's not attributed to my kids it should be attributed to work and it's being able to take that time guilt-free because you need it and you know yourself if you don't take care of yourself you can't take care of your business or your family um but yeah if I I if I push and push and push myself Mm -hmm. to keep going which is what I used to do I would make myself ill and then when I kept trying to push through things would take much longer to execute because my my I wasn't quite in the game I wasn't in the right headspace so taking that time to rest is important and I think also you know if you're in a creative role there's also something around giving yourself permission to take time to fuel your creativity you know maybe that looks like going to the art gallery or going out for a walk and you know it's I normally find it's on the dog walk and things are are maybe a bit quieter that's when I have my great ideas. I totally agree with you. I think um, I'm quite guilty of that, of feeling like, oh, I can't take this time away from work, but I'm the same. I walk I walk the dog in the morning before I start my work day. And quite often that is when the good ideas come through. I'll think of like, oh, it'd be great to do a post about that. Or, oh, you know, I, I don't know. It's weird how it comes to you when, or maybe it's not weird. You know, these things come to us when we're not sitting in this formal spot at our desk. Um, I'm also quite... I struggle to fall asleep like I'm a total night owl and I find it really hard to fall asleep at night and I find that's when a lot of my ideas come to me as well and I don't know if that's because it's finally quiet like I've been working all day and getting the kids off to bed and quite often going back and doing some work in the evenings then I'll read for a bit and then it's kind of like okay finally there's no distractions I'm not consuming any content there's no noise and it's like my brain just goes and goes so quite often I'll add like a note uh in the notes section of my phone or sometimes I'll jot something down in the notebook beside my bed it's just kind of funny how we need I think you're right we need that kind of rest and quiet time yeah. in order to be creative yeah exactly and see what you were saying about the sort of health how your health really affects your time I think so you've got Crohn's disease which is obviously a, a big thing a big added sort of obstacle and challenge for you and I've got PCOS so less so in terms of the physical stuff but my hormone levels are completely out of whack my cortisol is always really high and it's always trying to balance that out with exercise and what I eat and trying to manage stress and all of these things that are really hard to stay on top of when you're busy and trying to juggle all of these things but even for women who don't have maybe these added sort of health challenges, our hormones fluctuate so much during the month. And I feel that the sort of working world is very set up for men who have very little hormone fluctuation. And I've I've started kind of following a few people on Instagram who talk about this idea of trying to schedule your month based on energy levels. Mm. Um, and, you know, most of us kind of have a, a rough idea, like, well, this week I'll be feeling really productive and I'll be really go get it. And this week I'll be really struggling to maybe talk to people or be creative or whatever and trying to plan your month around that. Do you think there's any merit or do you think that's even possible when you run a business and you're wearing so many hats? I think it's definitely worth investigating. Like I, you know, and I I do encourage a lot of my clients to sort of try and adopt the mindset of a scientist. And and yes, it's because I am a scientist, (laughs) or at least I was a scientist, you know, but it's, and it probably comes very naturally to me. you know, in that we try things and we test it. And if it doesn't work, that's okay. But we're, we're sort of keeping track and making small adjustments and reflecting like, you know, to me, that's, that's something that should be done. Mm -hmm. Um, I have been over the last must be maybe the, yeah, this year paying more attention to the, the times of the month and re- recording that but for me personally I don't really notice a difference in my energy in terms of hormone uh, from that sort of angle but I do know others that it that it does and 
Um, so I think it is worthwhile having a look at in case it's something that's relevant to you. And whether that does then look like, you know, you're scheduling a couple of days of quiet time or admin or things that don't take up, <coughs> excuse me, things that don't take up a lot of energy yeah. um, or thinking time, you know, and can you schedule those at the relevant time of the month? Mm -hmm. Then, yeah, I, I think give it a try and see if that works. I like this idea of kind of playing a scientist in your own life and, and really paying attention because you're right, it will be different for everybody. Um, and, you know, it's probably not as straightforward as things are the same all the time, because obviously along with that, you just have whatever else is happening in your life. Or for you, I assume if you have like a sort of bad episode or a bad, I don't know what the right term is, but, you know, that must be unpredictable sometimes too. So maybe between the kind of being flexible and also being mindful of sort of what's going on at any given moment in time, we probably could all do a little bit better at planning out yeah. Um, yeah. how we use So for time. instance, um, I mean, for the most part, my Crohn's disease is very well managed. Mm -hmm. I take medication. I am really trying to be more mindful over what I eat and, you know, taking supplements and I'm exercising mm -hmm. and so on. So I think as I'm getting older, I'm a lot more aware of these kind of things. Um, but next week I'm going in for a routine colonoscopy, mm -hmm. which is not the most you know it's not a nice experience um and it's how can I best plan for that so yes you know if it's a flare-up that's really unpredictable mm -hmm. but I know that next week you know for at least two of the days I'm going to be out so it's thinking about well what can I be doing now in advance to plan for that um, so that I can allow myself the time and not feel guilty about having, you know, feeling like I have to do these other things. Mm -hmm. So this week is maybe a little bit busier, but that's okay because I know that, you know, the, the work I put in now is going to make it easier for me next week. Yep. No, that makes total sense. It's the whole going back to this whole idea of planning. So I wanted to speak a little bit about how you work. So I know that you share lots of really fabulous content through your Instagram um, and you do some really great sort of free workshops and things that people can take part in. And then obviously there's the option to work with you one to one or there's the option to join your membership. And I wanted to, I guess, chat a little bit about when you work with people one-to-one -one and the way that you start, I guess, from my own experience, having only just kind of starting working with you. But one of the first things that you asked me to do is to start tracking my time and to kind of pay very close attention, not just, oh, I worked between you know, nine and two or whatever, but actually writing down what I'm spending my time on. So why is that? Why is that an exercise that you suggest people kind of start with? Do most of us just kind of have no idea how we spend our days or what's the kind of thought behind that? Yeah, I think like the first bit is awareness. Yeah. And a lot of people don't know how they're spending their time. Um, a lot of people will plan their work you know, they might be in a, a nine to five or or they'll, you know, be working for themselves and sort of they'll have a plan for what they maybe do during the day. But a lot of people do not think about what they do in the evenings or the weekends. But because we don't think about the time, that's when it can start to feel like it doesn't exist or that the time is slipping through our fingers. Um you know, because we're not being intentional, we're not then steering ourselves towards what, you know, what our personal goals might be. And um, it's very easy to slip into effortless activities of an evening. Mm -hmm. um, so there's a, a an author in the time management space called Laura Vanderkam, and I really like her approach. And she talks about effortful versus effortless. So in an evening, a lot of people will finish a busy day of work and they'll pick up their phone and start scrolling or they will click on the TV and turn on Netflix and start watching a box set or whatever. But before you know it, hours can go past and it's because we're not thinking through and having a plan for that time, it can, it can just disappear really quickly. Whereas it's thinking about shifting that and 
like I plan my work and my leisure time, like my downtime also gets planned in advance so that I know, you know, I've got time with the children. There's a, there's balance there. I can look, you know, zoom out and look at the week as a whole and see, okay, there's time for me. I've got my exercise planned in, you know, I've got time to meet my friends and work on, you know, relationships or whatever. There's time with the kids. And it's it's all there mapped out. Because if we don't do that, then then that's when we sort of can feel like we don't have time. But when you actually track your time, there's this realization, oh, oh I, I do have time. I, do, I think it's such an interesting exercise. And I've only just finished doing that for the full week last week. Um, but it was quite interesting in now, I think that during the work day, because I knew I was tracking my time, that actually made me a bit more productive because I was like, well, I don't want to say that I've spent half an hour scrolling Instagram, so I better get off that and get back to work kind of thing. So that was interesting to me because it just goes yeah. to show if I wasn't doing that, that's probably what I would have been doing. Yeah. But what you're saying about the evenings is also really interesting because I think I feel quite a lot like I don't have any time for myself. And in fairness, I don't have a ton because you know I am doing a lot of my work hours and things in the evenings. But what I realized is like I used to read tons like I would, you know, I was the kid who would take out like a bag full of books from the library and read them all in a week kind of thing. And as I've gotten older, because I'm tired at the end of the day, I think I have just defaulted to, as you say, putting something on Netflix that I've already watched and I'm only half paying attention to. And then all of a sudden I'm like, oh, it's midnight. I should go to bed. And I haven't really felt like I've had you know, I mean, it's fine to have downtime and watch TV, but I haven't, it, it doesn't feel like an active choice. And it just feels almost like I've thrown those few hours away. So in the last couple of weeks, I've been trying to get back into reading before bed. So even if that means I still watch Netflix or whatever for a bit, but then I go up to bed half an hour earlier and read for half an hour. And it has felt like I've got a little bit of time back for me. So all it really took is me, as you say, it's that awareness of being aware, like, well, actually, I do have these two hours every night that I'm just wasting rewatching something I've, you know, seen a thousand times. Why don't I choose what I want to do with that time? Um, so, yeah, that the awareness thing is interesting. And the other thing that I thought was really interesting, you mentioned it kind of earlier in our conversation about how long things take and how most of us sort of underestimate how long a task takes but on the other side of that I have heard you speak whether it was can't remember if it was maybe at an event or if you shared it on your Instagram and is it called is it Parkinson's law right so yeah, tell us Parkinson's about that because I think this is super interesting so Parkinson's law essentially states that the the, the task will fill the time that you allocate to it hmm. so um you know, a lot, a lot of people will either give themselves too much time to complete something and we, you know, and, or, or they don't know how long something takes. And maybe, you know, you're working to a to-do list and you don't have a time blocked calendar, for example. So then if you've got something on your to-do list and you're working on it, you'll, you'll probably spend a lot longer working on it than what you might have done if you'd actually blocked out the time and given yourself a deadline. Um, and it's thinking about, can you then push yourself to bring in the amount of time that you're spending on things? You know, so I, I've i in the past, you know, maybe blocked out two hours to write a blog post, for example. Mm -hmm. Whereas if I push myself, I can I can actually do it quicker than that. And if I if I give myself an hour, it will get done in the hour. I think that's so interesting. So I am someone who up until this point has very much just had a to-do list for the week. And I might roughly say, I'm going to do this, this day and that day, but I didn't time block things out. And I'm also very bad for procrastinating. And I don't know if this is like a neurodivergent thing. I'm still sort of investigating that, or if that's just a, I don't know, a bit of a personality trait or what, but I always leave things, especially the things that I don't love to do or that I find tedious till the last minute. And it's interesting how if I do that, say I said that I would send something to you this week and all of a sudden it's Friday morning and I've not done it, then I'm like, I've only got three hours to get this done and I can do it. But the thing is, I could have done that in the three hours on Monday, but I leave it and then it causes anxiety and stress because yeah. it's sitting over, you know, it's kind of playing over and over in my head, all these things I have to do. And I promised I'd get it done by this time. And realistically yeah if I work to a deadline I can get things done quickly 
But I guess it's maybe getting in the habit of saying, okay, well, I'm going to do this on Monday in these three hours rather than going, oh, I have all week to do it and then just not getting it done. I don't know why yeah. my brain works that way. But um, yeah, it's interesting that time blocking rather than just a to-do list can make a big difference. Yeah, I mean, everyone's obviously different in the in the way that they're they're wired and the way their brain thinks, which is why I always sort of come back to this try it act like a scientist see what what works because it's not going to be a cookie cutter thing and it's not going to be the way that I work works for you and you know when it comes to time management and productivity like there are so many books I mean I've got loads of them behind me on the bookshelf like there's so many books there's so many different approaches and thoughts on things Mm -hmm. and 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 some will work and some might not um so yeah it's it's trying it on but I think for me, it's thinking about that workflow. So a lot of people will try and retain in their head what it is that they're, they have to do. And that can cause the overwhelm if you're retaining stuff in your head. Mm-hmm. So for me, it's thinking about having that one source of truth, your master to-do list, everything that you need to do is in that one place. But that in itself can be overwhelming, having mm-hmm. a big, you know, especially if it's, personal life kids work like put all that together and it's a lot um but it's then thinking about okay how do we prioritize that master to-do list how can we you know streamline that how what is it that's needed to be done this week but the next bit is putting it into the schedule because when you look at your week to view and I like to block out my like morning routine and my sort of evening wind down And when you see it in black and white like that, the amount of time that you've got during the day, you, there might be three, four things you need to do that week. And yes, if you then leave it to the Friday, you would probably get it done. But it's, if you look holistically at the calendar, it's showing you that it's, it's actually not going to work if you leave all that stuff to the Friday because you can see it there in black and white. And so it's then thinking about being really strategic with where you put the tasks and the blocks again, coming back to energy and so on. Like I know I work best in the mornings. So that's when I tend to carve out the deep thinking that I need to do or um, what is in the afternoons, you know, it might be there's some tasks that I can do that are pretty straightforward that don't need lots of thinking um, one of the other things actually that a client of mine does, um, particularly when kids are younger, is she had two lists where she had tasks that she had to be on her own to do, where she maybe needed thinking time and so on, versus tasks that she could do when the kids were around. And then you can then start to plan your schedule on the basis of, okay, you know, Tuesday's my day with the kids so that's the day that I need to fit these tasks in from this um, list that can be done when they're there versus okay I've got four hours on a Thursday when they're at nursery and so that's the day that I'm going to plug in the tasks that I need to focus. That's interesting I like that idea because there are definitely things like and for me like my youngest daughter's two and my older daughter's six so you know Charlotte's the older one if Charlotte's home she'll sit and play for a bit by herself or she can have some time on the iPad or she can watch a show or whatever and I know that if I'm not quite finished say editing something I can do that and she can actually sit right here beside me and you know and it it works but with Poppy being two the hours that Poppy's at home there's no chance I'm getting anything done at the computer but then I can maybe use that time to fold some laundry or so I really like that idea and trying to plan your week that way Um, and I think what you said too about seeing it in like having a visual representation of your week when you showed me that you had done that for me I think before our sort of first official meeting and when I saw it that way I think I beat myself up a lot thinking well I have the whole week how come I can't get as much done as I think but when you actually look at it and you see the time that is dedicated to like making dinner and getting the kids to bed and getting them sorted in the morning walking the dog all of that I don't have you know, 70 or 80 hours in a week, it's a lot less than that. Yeah. Um, and, it, you know, what you said too about blocking out like your morning and your evening routine, um, Miriam is the PT that I've been working with since my oldest was quite young. And she was very much from the start, like, listen, 
it's hard to fit workouts in when you're busy. So you have to treat it like a meeting. So she, that's her suggestion was to schedule it in like an appointment. And so it, I don't always go on the same days. It, it kind of depends on what I have on in a week, but at the kind of end of on a Sunday, if I look and go, okay, so I'm going to go Wednesday evening, Thursday afternoon, whatever, and slot it in, I'm way more likely to go. Whereas if I just say, I'm going to make sure I get to the gym three times this week, it often yeah. falls by the wayside. So it's funny, you know, I was able to implement that, but I never thought about doing that for, for a to-do list. I've always just kept that really open. Yeah. On the, on the going to the gym part, you know, the, the other thing that can often get overlooked are sort of the hidden time costs. So an example that I share often is that, you know, if I was going to a class at the gym, that might be an hour, the time I actually have to block out for that in my calendar is probably more like two hours mm. because I need to get my gym gear on. I need to fill up the water bottle. I need to actually drive to the gym yeah. and then do the class and then come home and, you know, put the stuff away, shower, what you know, whatever that might be. So it's all these like hidden time costs mm -hmm. that also really quickly add up um, because we that often gets overlooked, which is why... It's really helpful, especially when you're starting to have that buffer there in your schedule. No, that makes total sense. Um, and I wanted to ask you, while we're on the subject of sort of planning our time and things like that, let's talk a little bit about work-life balance and trying to find some sort of semblance of, I really, really think this is a trial and error thing. I don't think anybody's really totally nailed it and figured it out. If they have, I would love to know their secret. Um, but is there a way that sort of being more aware and planning our time better can help to kind of bridge that gap between work and and, and non-work lifestyle stuff yeah well I think I think so um the the author Carl New, Newport he shares that um if you time block your schedule you can get the same output from a 40 hour time blocked work week compared to a 60 plus hour unstructured work week so by planning in advance you're actually able to create more time mm -hmm. and then that more time that you're creating you can choose what what you do with it I mean most weeks I volunteer so in addition to the kids and the work and 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 stuff I like giving is important to me and I you know with my story with losing my mom I I volunteer at the local hospice and I do that most Wednesdays but I've been able to do that because I plan advance. Like I'm, I'm really intentional with my time and it might be, you know, for me, that time volunteering is self-care. Like I really enjoy it. it. Yes. The, the, the people that are there, I, um, I do mindfulness meditations for the outpatients at the hospice and yes, they take a lot from it, but I also take a lot from it. Like I, you know, I really enjoy that time. So whatever the, the self-care looks like for you, planning in advance can help you do that. Yeah, and that's such a good point about the volunteering because I think I do some volunteer work uh, sort of with the other side of my business, the wedding and family stuff. And it's a charity that sets photographers up with families who have either had um, a stillborn baby or a baby who was born and not meant to survive. And it's essentially remembrance photography going in and getting some photos Gosh. with the baby. And yeah. it's, you know, it's something that I started doing when my, well, was she even born yet? I'm trying to remember. I've done it for years, but I, you know, there are session requests often and quite often my schedule is so full, I can't fit it in anywhere. And I would like to be able to help out and do things like that more, or, you know, to have a little bit more time to, to play with, if you will. And as you say, it's your choice, how you spend it. But, you know, I, I don't want to be someone who's too busy to do any of these extra things or to help out. I want to make sure that there's flexibility. So I really I really like that idea about how you can, you know, be more productive in 40 hours than 60. Yeah. Yeah. Because that's that's a massive difference of 20 hours. Yeah. That's huge. And, you know, the other thing for me that's been massive is thinking about your environment Um. Mm -hmm because that can also have a massive impact on your time. You know, my space is pretty decluttered. I know where things are. Like, you know, the stats show that we can waste a lot of time searching for things. Mm -hmm. You know, even if that's digitally looking for files, um, that can take up a lot of time. Um, 
and because my environment is decluttered, it's less time to clean. Um, so there's all these different little things. Um, the other big one is like making decisions. So again, that can take up time and headspace. You know, if you're like putting off a decision and then it's there preying on your mind, you know, until you then take action. But um, thinking about what can you be doing to reduce the number of decisions you have to make, you know, it's it's been shown that we, on average, spend three hours a day deciding what to wear, what to watch, what to eat and what time to go to bed. Those four things seemingly can take on average three hours a day, which again, I like, I just find that wild. Yeah. So like, you know, I have a minimal wardrobe. Like I, I don't spend ages deciding what to wear. I, I don't watch TV all that much. You know, if I am watching TV, it's normally something that's been recommended. So I, I know it's going to be good. And then I also don't spend an hour looking through all the shows and Netflix <laughs> to make up my mind, yep. you know? Um, but it's all, all these like little things. Yeah. Yeah. And you know, I've noticed that, I guess this is maybe quite a specific, but see with content planning, for example. So I used to kind of just like not have any structure in place, which is really bad because one of the services I offer is strategy and helping people figure out what to post. So probably not great that I was taking my own advice, but you know how it goes, you get busy and you help everyone else and then you don't do it for your own business. So since I have sort of had a plan in place, so at the sort of end of every month, I just have a paper calendar and I'll slot in, like, I'm going to talk about this on this day and that on that day. And I don't always have all of my content pre-written and scheduled, but at least when I sit down at my desk, even if I haven't written that content, at least I know what I'm writing. Because what I was finding is exactly what you're saying there. It was the decision. So if I sat down and I had no idea what I was going to do, I would maybe go look at, oh, what shoots have I done recently? Or what have I not talked about for a while? And I'd go look at my feed and I'd, I'd probably waste half an hour just trying to decide what to write. Whereas if I sit down and I already know what I'm writing, it only takes me 10 minutes to write it. So I th- yeah. I think you're right. I can already see like my head's just worrying with all of the things that I could do that if I sort of better planned it out, I wouldn't waste the extra, you know, things wouldn't take twice as long because I have to make the decision. Yeah. So yeah, so there's all those different kind of things. And then, you know, the other thing when it comes back to the self-care, like thinking about making the appointment with yourself. So it's very easy to push out a bath or push out a walk or, um, you know, going to the gym on your own. That It's very, very easy to just say, oh, I'm too busy and it comes out with a plan. So again, with clients, when we're starting out and we're trying to build this muscle of, you know, planning and self-discipline and, 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 and making the time for these things, it's actually to book the appointment. So if I if I have funds and I am able to, I'll book myself an appointment for a massage. And I'm not going to then dismiss that. So then I know, okay, this month I've actually got something to look forward to and the self-care happens. Um, or I book the appointment with a friend to meet them for a coffee or a dog walk and I'm not going to let them down. And so I go and the thing happens. Um, so there's 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 different like clever ways that you can start to to plan in some time for yourself. No, you're right. You're much less likely if something's booked in or you've paid for it or you've promised a friend to actually follow through. Whereas it's pretty easy to just let yourself down and go, oh, I could use yeah. that hour to whatever finish up again something else on my to do list. Yes. And when I mean when I was a single parent with the two young kids, um. If I had enough money to do so, I would book a babysitter to come and I would like the the, the bit that I always found hard was just that last bit with the bath and getting them to bed. And, um, you know, by that point, I was tired and it just the kids were getting fractious and it, it just was, was never my favorite time of day. So and it, it wasn't like often, but I would book a babysitter I would take my magazine, go off to the local cafe, (laughs) have two hours to myself to read in peace. And then I would come back and they were in bed and it was bliss. 
That's perfect because I don't know I mean I find it hard my husband's really good he's very kind of active he actually tends to do more of the bedtime and bath time because I do more in the morning and drop offs and all of that which is great but even then I find it quite difficult I'm the same as you by the end of the day like my patience is worn thin I'm tired I just kind of want some peace and quiet um so I can yeah um, hats off to anybody that's kind of dealing with all of those daily routines themselves because I find it quite difficult sometimes and I guess it depends too like you know I am not a routine person so having kids to me has that's been one of the most challenging things is realizing that they do need a bit more of a routine and that you know I have to get up at this time every day to make sure that one gets off to school and the other gets off to nursery and I I don't know I find that routine really really difficult but you know maybe it's not a bad thing that having kids has sort of forced me to have a little bit of routine in my life because I think probably in terms of managing your time better a routine is helpful would you say or at least a sort of semblance of a schedule so again everyone is different like I do I do have clients that struggle with routine Mm -hmm. but I think I I personally believe a bit of routine is probably needed even if it's even if it's just the sort of planning in advance being the routine um because I also think, you know, planning in advance doesn't necessarily need to take away the spontaneity or, you know, you're actually going to make more time for fun if you plan in advance. Yeah. So it's trying to like shift that mindset around it, that it's, you know, it's not something that's, um, you know, it doesn't have to be something difficult. It doesn't have to like make your life boring. It actually creates more time for the fun stuff. So it's trying to see if you can shift that that mindset, I think is really important. So we have covered loads. We've talked about sort of planning out your time and being flexible and being kind to yourself, making time for self-care, you know, figuring out a little bit of a work-life balance and, you know, going back again to what you said about doing a little bit of trial and error and playing the scientist and just trying different things to see what works. Is there anything else that you would kind of recommend for anybody who is feeling the sort of overwhelm of, of trying to plan out their week. Is there anything that we kind of haven't covered that is a major um, major bit of advice or, or a good starting point or anything else you want to share on that? I think the awareness is the is the real first step. I think that's a big part of it. And if you were to ask people that feel like they've got enough time what what the key is they're intentional with their time Mm -hmm. and they they know where their time goes like it's yeah it's the planning in advance um so I think that I think the first step is actually figuring out where you are now and then maybe the next step from that is giving some consideration around well where would you like to be and once you know where you are and where you'd like to be, and, and I mean, this can be applied to all sorts of different things, but in intention, in, with respect to your time, it's thinking about where you are now, where you want to go, and then just what are the little steps that you can start to take that will, you know, always have that ideal week in your mind and see if you can keep nudging yourself closer to it. Perfect. Well, before I get you to kind of tell us where we can find you online and things like that, I'm putting you on the spot a little bit here because I don't think I prepped you for this. But, you know, since I've kind of shifted the podcast over to focus more on like motherhood and entrepreneurship specifically, I thought it would be a good kind of bit of bit of honest truth to ask all of my guests, what do you find the most difficult thing about juggling entrepreneurship and raising children? What's the hardest or the biggest challenge you find? Oh, you can think for a minute. Don't worry. (laughs) Yeah, the biggest challenge. I mean, there are loads and it'll be different for everybody. But I'm just I'm especially interested in your point of view, because I think managing my time for me is probably the trickiest bit. But you're obviously quite good at that. That is what you do. So I'm curious to know what you find kind of the most difficult. I think it's probably the prioritization piece is the hard bit because I love what I do. I I love my work and I I could quite happily spend hours and hours doing it. 
but it's then making sure that I am spending enough time with the kids and having the quality time with them. And, you know, I've seen me be out doing work stuff, but then have to cut it short or I get a phone call or I'm, you know, the kids need me and it's having to drop the work stuff to come and and be there for the children. Um, so yeah, I think probably something around the prioritization is is maybe the biggest challenge because it's definitely not time. Like I I do feel like I have enough time, enough time to get, you know, the important stuff done. I think that's the big part too, you know, we're not we're not going to be able to do it all. Yeah. Or at least we're not going to be able to do it all to the like Stepford wife, you know, perfection and it's thinking about okay what well what does good look like for me mm-hmm. and being okay with that um yeah I, I, that's part of it as well but yeah prioritization I think is probably the 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 bit yeah that's super relatable because I'm the same I'm so excited about my business and not that I haven't always been but especially in the last kind of year or two I feel like I really figured out like what I want to do and I really niche down and I'm really excited I've got all these big ideas in my head And I find it really hard sometimes to stop and like just go and have that time with the kids. And it's not that I don't enjoy my time with them. I I love hanging out with them, but it's just that way of like, when you are really excited and you love what you do and you're super passionate about it, it's saying, okay, but I've done enough of that for today. Now it's time to do this. I think comparison for me anyway, plays a little bit into that too, because I look at maybe other people that have similar businesses or do similar things who don't have children or don't have a partner or aren't, you know, DIYing a house as I look at ladders and things lying around here. (laughs) And I see them doing all of these things and I'm thinking, I want to do that. Or how are they finding the time to do all of that? And, you know, I think it's sometimes coming back to this idea about priorities and remembering that I set those priorities like nobody yeah. else is saying that I have to have that time as a mom or that you know I I need to only have Poppy in nursery these many days and have the time with her like I've made that decision because it's what I want and I think going back to that idea of like what's important to me what does success look like to me because it's not the same as you know success to somebody else so I think yeah that ties into that as well. It's looking at what everybody else is doing and trying to stick with your own plan and your own goals. Yeah. Yeah. And it will change as well, you know, and, and the the kids grow older and, you know, you, you do get more time. And um, so, yeah, I think it's just the, the power of reflection is also really good. Um, Yeah. And, and, figuring out like you say like what what is it that is most important at this point in time for this season for this year and kind of go from there perfect well I better let you go speaking of time management I have probably (laughs) kept you for longer than promised so before we do say goodbye though can you um just tell us a little bit about how people can find you online and how they can work with you obviously I'll put this in the show notes as well but yeah, so my website is sadastuart.co.uk um, and my surname is Stuart, E-W-A-R-T. And um, I've got a blog that I write, so there's loads of great articles and things in there, which are, are normally a good place to start. And then I'm also very active on Instagram. My handle is sadastuart.co.uk, same as my website. Um, So there are probably the two places that I would suggest people go to. Um, I do have a number of free resources as well, which is a great starting point. Um, And I, uh, you know, as you mentioned, I think at the start, I I run like one off free workshops every now and then. So that's the type of thing that I would be sharing with um, my Instagram followers. Um, And then lastly, I write an email newsletter that goes out every week. And there's normally a time management tip on the end of that. So you can get onto my mailing list through my website. That is perfect. And just really quickly before you go, the ways that people can work with you. So I know you have tons of free resources, which is fab, especially if people are just starting to kind of delve into this. But if they did want to work with you, what are the kind of ways they can do that? Yeah. So I run a time audit session, which is a one-off, one hour. Um, And we circle back and do a little 30 minute check-in a couple of weeks after just for like accountability if there's any questions and so on 
Um, then I run a membership. So it is a year long membership where you get access to monthly calls. There's a live community, but there's also the member private members area on my website that's got even more resources all of the tools and templates I use to to manage and organize my business are there. And then I do one-to-one coaching as well, if you need that um, extra bit of support too. Perfect. Well, thank you so much for your time. Um, and thanks for sharing all that kind of perspective and tips and advice and things as well. I think there's quite a lot there for people to kind of get started um, delving into this stuff. Um, so thanks a lot, Sarah. So Sarah's told you where you can kind of follow her online. And uh, I will also, you know, if you follow me over on Instagram, um, I will be sharing sort of what it's been like to work with Sarah as I go through my own time management journey. Amazing. Sounds good. Thanks so much for having me.